We heard the words talking about the prophet Jeremiah as he began his ministry, and so that's paired with words from Luke chapter 4, which is basically a description of the beginning of Jesus' ministry. We looked at the first verses in this passage last Sunday, and so we continue with the rest of the story. It's a reading from Luke chapter 4, verses 21 to 30. Jesus is preaching in his hometown synagogue of Nazareth, and he's read from the prophet Isaiah a compelling passage. And then our scripture picks up at that point. And then Jesus began to say to them, Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Now all spoke well of him and were amazed at the gracious words that came from Jesus' mouth. And they said, Is not this Joseph's son? Jesus said to them, Doubtless you will quote to me the proverb, Physician, cure yourself. And you will say to me, quote, Do here also in your hometown the things we have heard that you did at Capernaum. But Jesus said, Truly I tell you, no prophet is accepted in the prophet's hometown. The truth is, there were many widows in Israel in the time of Elijah when the heaven was shut up six, three years and six months, and there was a severe famine over all the land. Yet Elijah was sent to none of them except to a widow of Zarephath in Sidon. And there were also many lepers in Israel in the time of the prophet Elisha, and none of them was cleansed except Naaman the Syrian. Now when they heard this, all in the synagogue were filled with rage. They got up and they drove Jesus out of the town and led him to the brow of the hill on which their town was built, that they might hurl him off the cliff. But Jesus passed through the midst of them and he went on his way. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Loving God, draw near to us once more. Fill us with your spirit. Guide our thoughts and our very lives. And may these words and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. The story of the life and ministry of Jesus Christ really takes off in Luke chapter 4. In the three chapters before this, we read about Jesus' birth and his baptism, and we hear about how he spent 40 days in the wilderness and was tempted by the devil. When he emerged victorious from all of that, then Jesus headed to his hometown of Nazareth. And Scripture says, quote, he was filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. This Spirit seems to have literally guided and energized Jesus. He even went to the synagogue, and while he was there, he said boldly, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. And then Jesus proceeded to lay out for them this agenda of compassionate social justice. He said, I've come to bring good news to the poor, release to the captive, sight to the blind, freedom for the oppressed, and for us to celebrate the year of the Lord's favor. Now there was clearly an active spirit at work in Jesus, just like the active spirit that we hear about on Pentecost. When the Pentecost the Spirit came down into the disciples and then sent them out into the public square of Jerusalem to share with all the pilgrims the good news of the resurrection of Christ. And by faith, it's that same Spirit that moves in every church and in every one of you, in every church member. It's the Spirit that comforts us when we grieve, that strengthens us when we are bone-weary, that inspires us when we step outside of these walls and become ambassadors of hope to a despairing world. We, we want to live by this powerful spirit. So the question is, how does this happen? The story in Luke chapter 4 actually gives us an answer, but it comes in a way that's 
fairly unexpected. On that day, after Jesus read from the prophet Isaiah, there's no denying that things took a bad turn fast. One moment they were all amazed at this, the son of Joseph. The next moment they're filled with rage and want to throw Jesus over a cliff. As we consider this story, I want you to hold on to a piece of wisdom that was written by the African-American theologian Howard Thurman. Howard Thurman said this, the contradictions of life are not final. I want you to remember that, so I'm going to have you repeat after me. The contradictions of life are not final. Every one of our lives is marked by contradiction. There's no getting around it. We are, for example, social creatures, and yet here we are in the second year of a pandemic, isolating ourselves behind masks or staying at home. We happen to live as Americans in a wonderful, rich nation, and yet so often people are unhappy and anxious, self-medicating through drugs and alcohol and electronics. Our lives each day are marked by contradictions, yet our faith proclaims that these contradictions are not final nor ultimate. The beginning of Jesus' ministry was also marked by contradictions. There he was in his hometown synagogue being heralded for doing miracles and good deeds in the land, and then he's derided for the exact same thing because he's not doing it in his home. He's being lifted up as a wise rabbi of faith and teacher, and then he's renounced for daring to tell stories from their shared faith, these stories about Elijah and Elisha. He's welcomed to be a reader and a leader that day, and then soon he's going to be threatened literally with death. Contradictions in life are very real, but they are not final. And the proof of this fact is that Jesus was not thrown off the cliff. Instead, he walked back through the crowd and he went on his way. So let's look more closely at what he actually said and see how it was the power of the Spirit that shaped not only his words but also his actions at the end of the story. Before Jesus began preaching, his reputation preceded him. As I said, he'd done wonders in other cities. So when the hometown celebrity appeared in Nazareth, the expectation is that he would do more of the same for their benefit. Wasn't he one of them? Wasn't he a favored son? Wasn't he a member of their particular ethnic, religious, and regional team? But none of that was actually a priority for Jesus. He said, a prophet is not accepted in his hometown. And then he reminded them that God's grace has never been limited to some sort of in crowd. He reminded this group of synagogue insiders that God's love is also for the outsiders, for the Gentiles, the non-Jews. But that wasn't what they wanted to hear. In the time of Jesus, in the time of the Apostle Paul, in fact, in the entire time of the early church, the biggest challenge was convincing this Jewish group of believers that their faith in one God was also intended for non-Jews, those who weren't children of Abraham and Sarah. Now, we may be tempted to stand in our lofty pulpits and look down at these folks, at our predecessors, but we need to remember that the Christian church has exerted a lot of energy over the years to exclude people. It's divided the world into believers and those non-believers. It's divided congregations into Catholic versus Protestant, mainline versus evangelical. It's had a long history of saying men only when it came to church leadership of segregating whites from people of color, of barring anyone who was not at least perceived to be heterosexual, and of finding ways for economics to be that magic ticket of admission 
to churches and positions of authority, even as we would stand in pulpits and preach about a Savior who went to the poor and called them blessed and reached out to those on the margins. See, all these are the inherent contradictions of the faith we profess. And at times, those contradictions have been active even here. But the contradictions are not final. The Spirit always has the final word on the subject. And to illustrate this, I'm going to shift to one of my favorite topics, which is music. So a classic Christian text is the book Confessions by St. Augustine. So in book, number, in book number 11 of this, Augustine asks a very simple yet profound question. He basically asks, since we are creatures of the present moment only, how does music work? A single note, when you listen to it, actually has very little value. The meaning of a note only arises because of what comes before it and what comes after it. So if I sing one note, oh, it doesn't have a lot of value in and of itself. If I repeat it and put a word on it, holy, all right, maybe it has a little more value, but it still is not communicating very much. But through a combination of memory of what proceeds and anticipation, you both remember the notes you've heard and you anticipate the notes you expect to hear and out of that comes music. Holy, holy. Your mind takes what it remembers, what it hears, and what it anticipates to create something special, to literally create music, or a melody, or a hymn. Now, you can't make music from one note. You can't write a book from one word. And you can't fully become a child of God by yourself. Think of yourself as a single note, me. Now, you may be a lovely note, but alone, you can't make much music. You need literally other notes. You need other people to compose a melody of life. Now, instead of music, think about knowledge. You may be quite smart. You may know a lot of things, but human knowledge is never contained just in a single person. It's contained and found in lots and lots of people the world over. And like music, it involves knowledge, it involves what has come before, and it involves anticipation, things yet to be discovered. You can only create a song by interacting with lots of notes. You can only gain knowledge by tapping into the wisdom of the world in all of its diverse places. And you can only be a person of faith when you become part of a larger melody, a deeper wisdom, when you see God in all the relationships that make up this life, if you have that perspective, that is a spirit-filled perspective. So on that day in the synagogue, Jesus looked out upon his friends and his neighbors, and he looked them in the eyes, and that's basically what he told them. He had come into Nazareth filled with the power of the Spirit. And he said, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me to bring you good news, release, and sight, and freedom. And then he went on to say, This message, though, is not just for you. It's for those around you, especially those you might not think that God isn't caring for. Because God sees all of life, just as God saw the widow of Zarephath outside of Israel, starving and forgotten until Elijah knocked on her door. God saw the Syrian general Naaman stricken with leprosy until he was healed by the prophet Elisha. Jesus knew the people might not like this message, but in that melody, in that gospel, there was life. There was hope. 
There was the power of the Holy Spirit filling them and us with this certainty that the contradictions of life are not final. Now, when Jesus said all these things, the crowd grew furious. They considered his words blasphemous. They wanted a private God, not a global God, and they'd kill anyone who suggested otherwise. They literally herded Jesus out of town. They planned to throw him over a cliff and then stone him. But Scripture says Jesus turned and passed through them and went on his way. The angry shouts were met with a quiet yet firm presence. The violence was countered with a resolute nonviolence. The tribal faith was defeated when the Savior of the world simply went on his way out there amongst Jews and Gentiles, amongst women and men, amongst lepers and Pharisees alike. Now, a few years later, another mob is going to shout at Jesus and call him a blasphemer and demand again that he be put to death. And they will push him once more to a different hill, this time a hill named Golgotha. And in place of stones, their weapon of choice will be a cross. And as the sun set on that day, they would think that their one little note and their narrow little faith had won. But on Easter, Jesus would once more move amongst them. Once more, his song would be sung. The contradiction of the cross would be proven not to be final through an empty tomb, through a deeper truth that was revealed in the resurrection. See, the story is so powerful because there's a symmetry between the beginning of Jesus' ministry and literally the end of his ministry. Filled with the power of the Spirit, Jesus preached in the synagogue, and he shares this expansive gospel. And by that same Spirit, he would overcome the crowd's angry contradictions by literally walking unharmed through the midst of them. The same Spirit is given to us. The same Spirit fills us, fills you and me. It connects us to one another. It it gives us life. It gives us strength. It provides that resolution to the contradictions. In place of anger, peace. In place of fear, hope. In place of death, life. So breathe in and breathe out and then you too go on your way filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. Thanks be to God. Amen.